This is Mr. Robison and this is our first video in our unit on three-dimensional geometry. What we're going to learn how to do in this unit is we're going to learn how to find the surface area and the volume of a number of different types of three-dimensional objects. Before we do that, we need to know some words, so we need to learn some vocabulary. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on in this video, is talking about some new vocabulary words, talking about what makes a prism a prism, what makes a pyramid a pyramid. Uh, before we do that, though, let's see why we might need to know about some of these things. Why do we need to learn about surface area? Why do we need to learn about volume? So we're going to take a look at some examples from nature where these concepts appear. I'm listening to this audiobook called How the Earth Was Made, and in the chapter on minerals, the author says the word tetrahedron over and over and over. He's like, tetrahedron this, tetrahedron that, tetrahedron, tetrahedron, tetrahedron. I'm like, ah, I never want to hear that word again. But the reason he says that word so much is because, well, tetrahedrons appear a lot in geology, in minerals. 90% of our Earth's crust is made up of something called silicates, which are made up of the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. Uh, you can see there's a picture there of some quartz. That quartz is an example of a silicate. We're going to refer to um, tetrahedrons as uh, triangular pyramids, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Have you ever wondered why you don't see any giant insects walking around or why cells are so small? It has to do with something called the surface area to volume ratio. There's an important biological process called diffusion where molecules move from an area of high concentration to low concentration across a membrane. Without going into too much detail, I'm just going to tell you that it's important for that membrane to have a lot of surface area relative to the volume of the object. Okay, well, what does that have to do with giant insects? Well, if insects were to get too big, big, they would have too much volume relative to the surface area of their tracheal system that they breathe through. So they basically wouldn't be able to uh, sustain themselves. There wouldn't be enough surface area for the oxygen to diffuse through into their bodies. So if for some reason that theory is wrong and we do get invaded by giant insects from space, let me just say that I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I can be very useful. As a middle school teacher, I know where there are a lot of students who can um, uh, volunteer to work in your sugar mines. So, um, Oh, oh, oh so, uh, excuse me. I was just uh, referring to my uh, Dungeon Master's Guide here because I play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, maybe you don't. Maybe you're not as super cool as me. It's okay. Not everybody can be. But uh, you may know somebody who plays Dungeons and Dragons and you might have seen them rolling these really cool dice like 20 sided dice, 12 sided dice, 10 sided dice. Well, those are more examples of... Uh, three-dimensional solids that you don't really see them in nature. I wouldn't call that nature, but you definitely see that outside of a math class. So I think we've seen enough um, examples of where we're going to see these three-dimensional solids. Let's move into the vocabulary section and talk about some new words. As promised, here are the vocabulary words. They are polyhedron, polyhedra plural, edge, face, vertex, vertices plural, prism, and pyramid. So you may have heard some of these words before, which is great. Uh, just think for a moment. Do, do you recognize any of those words? We are going to go over them one by one and discuss their meaning, but it's always a good idea to think about it a little bit before we jump right into it. So have you seen those words before? And if so, in what context? So far, I've been pretty loose with my language. I've been saying things like three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional solids. But the math word that we want to use to describe these things is 
polyhedron. And our definition of polyhedron is going to be a three-dimensional shape made up of polygons. So if we look at this big icosahedron right here, this is something a student made last year. Uh, it is a three-dimensional object, and it's made up of well, in this case, equilateral triangles, okay? It's made up of polygons. I won't go into polygons. We, we know that from our unit on two-dimensional geometry. But uh, yeah, so equilateral triangle, equilateral triangle, and so on. So this is a polyhedron. Uh, plural of the word polyhedron is polyhedra. All right, let's move on. Our next vocabulary word is edge, and our definition is going to be where two planes intersect in a line. So if you look at the diagram next to me there, there I have highlighted the edges in red. If you want to take a look at another example, let's take a look at this triangular prism right here. So if you imagine this flat surface as being part of a plane, and this flat surface here as being part of a plane, well, if you look here where those two planes would meet in a line we are calling that an edge so here is our edge you can see there's a number of edges in this triangular prism we're going to have to count those later but for now just know that this is an edge Okay, moving right along, our next word is vertex. Vertex is where three or more planes intersect at a point. So you can see in the diagram next to me, I have uh, pointed with arrows at the vertices. That is the plural for vertex, not vertexes, vertices. Uh, here's another example. So if we look right here, we have uh, this plane this plane and this front plane all meeting at this point right here this point is a vertex 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 a lot of people just call them corners but the math word for the corner is a vertex the next vocab word is face our definition is going to be a flat surface which is a polygon and i'm going to go ahead and use the same example that's in the diagram to try to make a little bit more sense of it so if we look at this triangular prism right here, we can see that it has a polygon on top, a flat surface that's a polygon. In that case, it's a triangle. That is one of its faces. It also has a rectangular face in the front. It has a triangular face on the bottom. And then if you look at the back here, it has two rectangular faces. So this triangular prism has five faces altogether. It has five flat surfaces that are polygons. Our next word is prism. And we're defining a prism as a polyhedron with two parallel congruent faces. So let's take a look at this prism right here. Well, what makes this prism a prism? If you look here, it's got a triangular face. It has an opposite congruent triangular face, these two faces are parallel. These two parallel congruent faces, we call them the bases. I know that's confusing. Face, base, they sound almost the same, but that's the language we use. So what kind of prism is this? We name prisms after the shape of their base. So this base is a triangle. That makes this a triangular prism. A bigger triangular prism, triangle, congruent triangle, parallel, triangular prism. How about this one right here? Okay, so we have an octagon, an octagon there. They are congruent, they're parallel, that makes this a prism, and we name a prism after its base, so this is an octagonal prism, octagonal prism, excuse me. Um, then we have a, oh, kind of boring after the other two, but what would you call this? Think about it for a moment. I have a rectangle here, a rectangle here. Those two rectangles are parallel and congruent. That makes this a prism. It's a rectangular prism. Now, the kind of weird thing about rectangular prisms is this. Um, well, you have a rectangle here and a rectangle here that are congruent and parallel as well. So really, 
any of these pairs can be considered bases. I know that's kind of weird, but don't don't get too confused. Like, well, why is this one the base and not this one? It doesn't matter. We just have to call one the base. When we find the volume of a prism in the next lesson, we're going to just designate one as the base. But OK, there you go. There's prisms for you. Let's move on to our last thing. Our last vocabulary word is the one that probably the most people are familiar with, and that is pyramid. You've seen pictures of the Egyptian pyramids. You've heard Egyptian lovers say pyramids are oh so shiny. Oh wait, that's probably just me that's heard that. But you know what a pyramid is. Okay, well our definition is going to be a polyhedron with one base that's a polygon and faces that are triangles. So let's take a look at this pyramid, for example. So we have a base down there. The base is a polygon and all these faces are triangles. Now, I like to think of pyramids as having a base and then all the edges go up to a point at the top, but this is probably a better definition that we're using here. Just like prisms, we name pyramids after their bases. So this has a rectangular base. We would call this a rectangular pyramid. Let's see. Let's take a look at this one. It has an octagon as a base and then it has triangles for faces, we would call this an octagonal pyramid. Um, we already saw this one, and it is a pyramid. It has a base, which is a polygon, and then has triangular faces. It is a triangular pyramid. I also called this a tetrahedron earlier when we were talking about geology. You can use the word tetrahedron. Uh, like I said, we're just going to call it a triangular pyramid to keep consistent with our language. Okay, so there you have it, pyramid. And those are all of our vocabulary words. All right, we know all the vocabulary we need to now. We can finally get to the assignment. Okay, what are you going to do for this assignment? You're going to be given a polyhedron. Well, actually, you're going to be shown a picture of a polyhedron. I'm not going to, like, hand deliver polyhedra to each and every one of you. That would be most difficult and awkward. Okay, so you're going to be given a diagram of a solid, a polyhedron, and then you're going to have to identify it. You're going to have to name the number and shape of the faces, and then you're going to have to name the number of edges and vertices. Okay, so let's say, let's start with this. Okay, so you, you get this, and I mean, I'm looking at it, a, a real thing here. You're going to be looking at a diagram, but, well, I look at it, and I say, hmm, it's got a uh, triangle there, a triangle there. They are parallel and congruent triangles. That makes this a prism. These parallel congruent polygons are the base, so this is a triangular prism. All right, it's a triangular prism. Great. Now, name the number and shapes of the faces. It's got a triangle here, a triangle here. It's got two triangular faces. It's got one, two, three, three rectangular faces. So that's the answer to that part. It has two triangular faces, three rectangular faces. Finally, name the number of edges and vertices. Okay, well, I count the edges. I got one, two, three up on that triangle. And then I count the three going down, connecting the two triangles together. That makes six. And then I have three edges on this triangle here. So that gives me nine edges. And then the number of vertices, well, one, two, three on that triangle, one, two, three there. I have six vertices. So your answer is going to look something like this. It's going to say triangular prism two triangular faces, three rectangular faces, nine edges, and six vertices. So for uh, example problem number two, I'm going to show you how to write the answer. First thing you need to do is identify the solid. I can see that it's clearly a pyramid. It has a rectangle as a base, so that's a rectangular pyramid. Next thing I need to do, I need to name the number and shapes of the faces. So I'm going to go ahead and count the faces. I have a triangle face. Actually, I have four triangular faces. So I'm going to write that four triangular faces. 
and if I look down there at the bottom I see there is a rectangle down at the bottom so that is one rectangular face if you want to write the total here you can it may help you for the bonus content coming up next I know I didn't do that in the previous example but in this example I'm gonna go ahead and write five faces altogether and then I need to count the number of edges and vertices count the corners first that's nice and easy five vertices and then finally I'm gonna to need to count the edges I can see that there are um, four edges down at the bottom and then four edges leading up to the point so that's a eight edges all together There is a relationship between the vertices, faces, and edges of a polyhedron. You may have noticed there is an assignment in addition to the regular homework assignment that is extra credit. And what I want you to try to do is find a relationship between the vertices, faces, and edges of a polyhedron. Now, I've had seventh graders do this before, and it's a pretty difficult thing to come up with. So I, I, it works better if you, I give you a hint. And that hint is there's a two somewhere in the equation, there's a plus, and there's a minus. So let's say, for example, I tried to come up, uh, or, or I made the formula V plus F is equal to two minus E. Okay, I used all the symbols. Well, let's see, does that work? I know a triangular pyramid has six vertices, five faces, and nine edges. So does the formula work in that case? Well, no, it doesn't, because if I take the vertices, six, plus the faces, five, I get 11. And then on the other side of the equation, I have two minus nine, which is negative seven. Is 11 equal to negative seven? Of course not. So that's not the correct formula there. All right, so all you got to do is you just got to play with it. You got to move some vertices and or move some symbols around in your formula. Um, try taking a look at a bunch of different polyhedra, counting uh, the vertices, faces, and edges, and hopefully you'll see a, a pattern develop. The last thing I wanted to show you here is just some artwork that some students did. Um, I offered uh, up some extra credit for people who can help with some of the designs. I didn't get to use everything, so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who contributed to, uh, some artwork to this project. And uh, maybe next time I'll use yours in the main body of the video. So thanks a lot.